Hello, welcome to the shop, home of many a knick-knack and curious item that might take your fancy. Can I help you, or are you just here to get out of the rain? <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I quite understand. Beastly weather to be outside in. However, since you are here, why not have a look around? See if anything catches your eye. Ah, I see the chest has caught your attention. Yes, good piece. Oak panels, strong iron fastenings. Old as well. I hear it dates back to the early 1800s. I wouldn't touch it, though. I admire your enthusiasm, but as lovely as the chest is, I'm afraid it has some history. No. It wouldn't be fair for me to sell it without first telling you about the legend of the mistletoe bough. This tale concerns one Lord Lovell and his new bride on their wedding day. And growing tired of dancing, the Lord's new wife suggested a game of hide-and-seek to their guests. Uh, the company agreed, and so she set off through the castle, up the winding staircases, and through dark passages she went, without a care in the world. Eventually, the bride reached the attic, in which she found a sturdy oak chest. A perfect hiding place. She climbed inside and shut the lid, waiting for her husband to find her. And far below, Lovell and his guests searched room to room, but in each were unable to locate the bride. Hours passed, and soon what had started as jovial play became a panicked search, with shouts and screams for the bride ringing out around the house. Alas, these all went unanswered. Days turned to weeks, which turned to months, and these became years. Somewhat understandably, Lovell moved out after a time. I imagine tired from the endless imaginings about what happened to his blushing bride. It wasn't until some years later, when the new owners were sorting through the attic, that fateful chest was discovered again. It took a great effort to prise it open, the lid somehow fusing shut when it had closed all of those years ago. And there, inside, lay a skeleton, adorned in a beautiful bridal gown. A fair number of English houses lay claim to the story, and to the chest, but I assure you that these are all tourist traps. So what do you reckon? Would you like to have a look inside? No? Yes, I thought not. Probably for the best. I suppose it's not the peace for everyone. Welcome to the shop, home of everything from the mysterious to the bizarre. You've come in rather late, so excuse me as I finish up for the day, but do feel free to have a look around. Awfully dark outside, isn't it? The street lights in these parts have a tendency to go out. Still, nice enough area. You should be untroubled on the walk home. Although, that's not always the case. These winter nights remind me of a tale. You see that jar of earth? Well, there's a story behind that if you'd like to hear it. Fairly unassuming, I know, but like most things here, it does have a darker side. You would? Well then, allow me to start the fire. Some stories aren't meant to be told in the dark of an evening. <sighs> There is nothing special about the jar itself, rather, the earth that's in it. You see, the earth inside has a connection to a certain 
Black Alice, and I dare say her tail is not one for those prone to a nervous disposition. Just outside of Leicester, in the early 1800s, there was a hill on which stood an old oak tree. Beneath this tree there was a cave, not naturally formed though, it had been dug into the side of the hill by hand, or something comparable to a hand at least. In the surrounding villages there are a spate of disappearances, all children who went missing in the dead of night, snatched from their beds, never to be seen again. The only clue to any of their fates came some days after they went missing, when, on that old oak tree, it became disturbingly clear that someone was hanging human skin from its branches. Specifically, children's skin. Of course, people went to the tree in search of answers, but it was common for them to meet the same fate as those children, and so this quickly became an unadvisable thing to do. Rumours started circulating, but the consensus was that it was the work of the witch, or demon, known as Black Anis. Short glimpses in the hills at night led people to piece together her description. They said she was tall, with skin that had a blue hue. Limp yellow hair hung down over her ragged face, which covered her eyes, or eye. There is some debate about that. But... Uh, what people do agree on were her claws. Instead of hands, Annas had great talons at the end of her fingers, and these were what she used to reach into open windows and drag screaming children into the night, or snatch at anyone who got too close to the entrance of her cave. They say that once she had taken a victim into the cave, she would feast on them, draining the poor soul of their blood and then eating the rest. Save for the skin. As I've already mentioned, she would hang this out on the oak tree above the cave for anyone who dare go near to see. Uh, it would probably be the last thing they ever saw, wouldn't it? <laughs> Quite the sight. After a while, people stopped going near, and they learned to lock their doors at night, so it all eventually stopped. Some say that she has a tunnel that runs from her cave to Leicester Castle. Others say that when a housing estate was built on top of this hill, the cave was filled in. Some years ago, when Ty went up to visit her haunts, I found that cave, and it had indeed been filled in. The only thing was, there was a hole in the entrance, and disturbed earth pushed outwards from the inside. So, who really knows the fate of Black Anis? Well, the fire is dying down and most of the natural light outside is gone. Probably for the best of you hurry home, if you're not going to buy anything, that is. You can never be quite sure what lurks in the shadows, can you? Three o'clock in the morning is an awfully strange time to go shopping. You are aware that the sign on the door says that we're closed. Oh, evidently not, given it was unlocked and yet you still chose to break the window to gain entrance to my property. Tell me, what is it you came in to take? Or did you just want to have a private browse? Don't try and leave. I'm not holding this cane because I can't walk. Look at you. Scruffy, dirty, on the wrong side of the law. A properly lost soul. Yes. There used to be a woman who would look out for people like you. Well, she's long gone now. Would you like to hear about her? If you humour me, perhaps there won't be a need to call the police. Ah, you would. 
Well, in that case, have a seat, and I'll tell you the tale of Ginny Bingham. Ginny was born around 1600 to a brickmaker and his wife. As a youngster, she would travel around the country to wherever her father's work would take them, allowing her to experience all types of people and ways of life. At the age of 16, she met a boy known as Gypsy George, and soon after, fell pregnant. The couple then lived together in a small cottage outside of Kentish Town. So far, it seems like a fairly idyllic existence, doesn't it? However, it was around this point when things took a turn for the worse. George was convicted of stealing sheep, and after being found guilty at the Old Bailey, was hanged for his crimes. In her misery, and I assume due to judgment crowded by grief, Ginny started having relations with a drunkard named Darby. These relations were wrought with violence. The couple would fight and, well, Ginny would be beaten. Then, one day, after she discussed the matter with her mother, Darby simply disappeared. No one knew what happened to him and, well, no one really seemed to care as no official inquest followed. Then again, what is there to miss about a violent drunk? Would you mind covering the hole you made in my window with this? I don't particularly want a breeze blowing through here. That's better. Where were we? Yes, the disappearance. Although life was on a momentary upturn for Ginny, this was soon to change. You see, her parents were accused of causing the death of a young girl by witchcraft. For this crime, they were both hanged. Whether they were guilty or not, I cannot say, but what I do know is that out of loneliness, Ginny found herself in the arms of another ill-suited man who went by the name of Pitcher. Again, the relationship was marred with arguments, and in order to take shelter from the abuse Ginny would shout at him, Pitcher would often seek refuge in the oven of the house. A strange hiding place, and one that would eventually lead to his demise. For one day, his child remains were found in that very oven. Murder charges were brought against Ginny, but after a testimony from a reputable source that Pitcher would regularly take shelter in that same oven, she was acquitted. Quite the accident, isn't it? However, while the law had no issue with her, the local people did. And this was how she earned the name of Mother Damnable, or the Shrew of Kentish Town. And from this point on, she became a recluse. Any dealings she had were at night, and no one knew who these dealings were with. Around the 1640s, another man entered Ginny's life. An unknown man. Some say that he was a wealthy refugee from the English Civil War who recovered Ginny's expenses in exchange for a safe and isolated place to stay. He stayed for years and arguments were frequently overheard by passing villagers who had no choice but to walk by the cottage on their travels. This was until one day, no more arguments were heard. Perhaps, unsurprisingly, the mysterious man was found dead. The locals suspected that Ginny had poisoned him, but there was no evidence of this at the inquest that followed. From then on, Ginny was self-sufficient, dealing with strange visitors in the night, accompanied only by a black cat. Who knows why they went to the cottage. Perhaps they desired their fortunes read, to deal in other arcane matters or simply for alternative medicine that she is rumoured to have made. It was around the 1680s when she died. We can only estimate, as it took the wary villagers some time to build up the courage to enter the cottage. When they eventually did find her, she was sat in her chair, completely rigid, a pot laid out on the table in front of her. The villagers then made her cat drink the liquid inside the pot and all of his hair fell out. Soon after, it lay dead at its master's feet. Some say 
that as she lay in that chair, the devil himself stood watching over her. It's said that she haunts the pub that now stands where her cottage used to be. If you did want to visit her, I could always tell you which one. Well, that concludes the tale of Jenny Bingham. Sorry, what was that? Oh, what happened to the child? My, my, you actually were paying attention. It's a good question. The account of her later life never describe her child, so it's probably safe to assume he perished young. Then again, who knows? She led such a private life, it's impossible to say. Perhaps she was given to an orphanage, or maybe was taken in by a kind foster family, far from the superstitious locals that berated and feared Ginny. It's possible that he grew up and opened a shop. However, we will never truly know. Funny you should happen by tonight, of all nights. I have just started the process of finding a new assistant. You wouldn't like the job, would you? Clearly, you have at least some interest in matters such as this. No? Well, that is a shame. It's always easier when they comply. Hello, welcome to the shop, home of everything from the frightening to the forbidden. How can I help you? Food. I'm afraid we don't sell that here, or at least any we have you wouldn't want to eat. You must be desperate if you've come here, of all places, for food. What is happening out there? Panic buying combined with an import shortage. Well, it's not ideal, but people have gotten through worse. So much worse. I might not be able to offer you food, but how about some nourishment for the mind? A story about people in a situation not so dissimilar to yourself. Excellent. Draw up a chair, and I'll begin. Begin the tale of the Black Dog of Newgate. Fifteen ninety six was a troubling year for England. Disease and bad harvests were forcing people from all classes into a state of starvation. However, none so were more affected than the poor and the marginalized. With this in mind, consider being incarcerated at Newgate Prison. When regular law-abiding citizens out in the streets are starving, who would care about the robbers, murderers, and the con men behind bars? Now, imagine being a prisoner, shunned by all the other inmates, finding yourself on the bottom rung of a ladder that leads nowhere. This is exactly the situation inmates accused of witchcraft found themselves in. It's in this environment when... Food is scarce and tempers run high, that one discovers what they are truly capable of. Tell me, how hungry would you have to be to eat a fellow man? Perhaps if that man was an outcast of society, the burden on you would be lessened. <laughs> no, of course not. I'm sure your morals are far too mighty for that. However... When the prisoners had a convicted sorcerer cast in amongst them, they saw it as a blessing. A man who, if he had been left alive, would surely have placed curses and spells on all those in the vicinity anyway. So, they killed him. And, like a pack of feral animals, tore him apart, consuming him without a guilty conscience. The thing people tend to fail to understand about sorcery 
is that it doesn't necessarily end once death has been encountered. This was a lesson those cannibalistic inmates were soon to learn all too well. In the nights that followed their heinous act, almighty screams could be heard ringing down the corridors of the prison. The people that the screams originated from had two interesting things in common. The first is that they all partook in the murder and consumption of that sorcerer. And the second is that they were dead. Nothing more than a mess of gristle and bone on the stone floor of their cell. After a few nights, the rumours began. Those in neighbouring cells spoke of the monstrous figure of a shadowy demon dog pacing up and down the corridor. Fearing to look for too long, they would hide and then be treated to a series of deep growls before the screaming of the condemned would begin. The person of death was of course identified, and it's at this point that the story differs slightly, depending on who tells it. Some say the cannibalistic prisoners were stalked in the dark shadows of the prison and picked off, one by one. Others say that some successfully escaped, but were then hunted down wherever they hid, ripped apart by an unknown beast. I suppose it doesn't matter which you choose to believe. The end result is the same. Of course, Newgate Prison is demolished now. Has been for some time, in fact. However, even though the demon dog fulfilled its vengeful hunger, they say its presence can still be felt. Eamon Court is the site that used to be the hallway that led to where the prisoners would be executed. It's said that a black mass can be seen here, but there is no consensus to whether this is the black dog of Newgate or not. Well, there is a little reminder of how bad things can get. I do hope you find another shop that can meet your needs. <laughs> Remember, your actions will have consequences. Hello, welcome to the shop, home of everything from the tempting to the terrifying. Quite the commotion outside, isn't it? Neighbours can cause all kinds of issues, can't they? Some more than others, it has to be said. I've got a feeling that ambulance outside is to do with one of mine. Would you like to hear about them? I assure you, it's more interesting than just local gossip. Excellent. Although in return, I would ask that you clean up the glass you broke. Water under the bridge, I assure you, but it somewhat rubs salt in the wound if I do it myself. Here, take this broom. Thank you. Feel free to take a seat and I'll tell you the tale of 50 Barclay Square. <laughs> Mayfair is a wonderful part of London. Old townhouses there contain expensive restaurants, lawyers' offices, and even provide places of residence to the rich. However, but one of these is not at all like the rest. That is, of course... 50 Barclay Square. When records first started being kept, the house was no different to any other on the wealthy street. The former Prime Minister George Canning lived there until his death in 1827, and until 1859, a fairly unassuming woman called that place her home. However, this state of normality 
was soon to change upon the arrival of its next resident, Thomas Myers. During the beginning of his stay, there wasn't much to report, but as soon as the house started to fall into disrepair, rumours began to circulate. They say that after being rejected by his bride-to-be, Mr. Myers became a recluse. Despite owning the entirety of the vast house, he would live only in the attic. Sleeping throughout the day, he would only emerge from the top room at night, navigating his way around the house by a single candle. That's how people knew he had died. They no longer saw the candle moving from window to window from the street outside. People say that living in grief like this caused him to go mad, and judging by his actions, I would say that this is fairly accurate. Curiously, his reputation did have its advantages. Upon failure to pay his council tax, he was sued by the local council. However, even though Mr. Myers failed to appear in court, he wasn't prosecuted, the magistrate letting him off the hook as he lived in a haunted house. A small benefit to losing your sanity, I suppose. Although Myers was mad, he himself wasn't the supposed haunting. Since he'd started residency, stories of apparitions had spread through the wealthy streets. There were several of these, and I will let you decide for yourself whether all, one, or any are true. The first describes an apparition of a young woman haunting the upper floors. Supposedly, the poor thing was abused by her uncle, and out of despair, threw herself from one of the high windows. The second concerns a young man who was locked in the attic of the house. He was then fed through a small hole in the room's door, and eventually went mad, somewhat understandably, before dying. Finally, there is the tale of a young girl who used to live there long ago. They say a sadistic servant of the family took a particular disliking to her, and so killed her. That's possibly the most tragic of the three. With such variations in tales of haunting, it is only to be expected that there is also a fair bit of discussion around the apparition, or apparitions, that supposedly appear. Some say it is simply a brown mist, while others suggest that it is more definitively the figure of a woman. These stories and reported sightings of apparitions gained some notoriety, and led to Lord Littleton calling a bet, attempting to stay for a single night in the attic. In the interest of self-preservation, he brought his shotgun with him to ward off whatever stalked the corridors of the house. I doubt he had any real intention of using it, but in the late hours of the night, he did indeed fire it. It is reported that an apparition approached him, and he shot at it in order to ward it off. However, upon the arrival of the morning, only the shotgun cartridges could be found, with no trace of the entity he had fired upon. Two more stories of strange encounters in the house followed this one. In 1879, Mayfair magazine published an article that reported a maid who had spent the night in the attic and had had a terrifying encounter. How terrifying? Well, supposedly whatever she saw drove her mad. She died a few days later, after being transferred to an asylum. Upon investigating the attic by one of the maid's employers, it was said that the room had a distinct smell which reminded the investigator of a zoo. The second encounter concerns a Captain Kentfield. They say that he attempted to spend a single night in the house, but after a few hours, a gunshot was heard, and after the authorities came to help, they found his dead body on the floor, his face frozen in terror. Now this story bears a striking similarity to the Lord Littleton tale. Whether they are one and the same, I cannot say. The mists of time have obscured this slightly, I'm afraid. People have also capitalised on the house's notoriety. During the 1870s, another story circulated that two sailors had entered the house and were confronted by the ghost of Thomas Myers himself. 
One ended up impaled on one of the railings at the front of the house, while the other barely escaped with his life. However, as tempting as it may be to want to believe this story, it proved to be a purely fictional tale written by Elliot O'Donnell. Until recently, the house contained a bookshop specializing in rare tomes, but I believe the owners have now moved premises. I don't know why they moved. Perhaps they wanted to expand their business. Or perhaps there is another reason. Well, that concludes the most documented hauntings of the house. Now, I should say there is a reason I've explained all this to you in such great detail. That glass you broke on your way in. I'm afraid it was sold to me many years ago by a person who obtained it from 50 Barclay Square. I don't think it has any real significance. It doesn't feature in any of the legends, but probably worth mentioning. Perhaps find a route that doesn't take you past that address. There really is no point in playing with fate, is there? Hmm. <sighs>